The sandbar off Lobster Beach in the entrance to Brisbane waters is a notorious spot for boating accidents. Shortly after 8 o'clock this morning it claimed another victim. A 5 metre half cabin runabout got into difficulty and was tossed upside down by a wave. Two people swam clear of the vessel and were picked up by a passing pleasure boat. A woman, however, was caught in the submerged cabin area. Police launches Brooklyn and Edelong were called in, but it wasn't until Sydney's Westpac rescue chopper arrived that the woman's body was released. I jumped into the water and uh, with our diving equipment on and entered the overturned boat and uh, found the woman's body still inside the, inside the boat. She was raced to Etalong Beach where frantic attempts were made to revive her. She didn't respond and was rushed to Gosford Hospital where she was dead on arrival. Efforts to right the overturned boat were hampered by the difficult conditions on the sandbar. It was eventually taken in tow by a police launch and moored at nearby Booker Bay. Just looking at the boat, it's hard to realise that the accident had such severe consequences. Apart from much grief, the accident is also a reminder that as on our roads, on the water, complete care and concentration are needed at all times. The new man at the development board will be remembered by many Novocastrians. Jim Fuller left his home city for Queensland 12 years ago, where he eventually became state manager of the National Trust and manager of the Corumbin Bird Sanctuary. Formerly a Maitland High School boy, Mr Fuller gained an honours degree in economics at the University of Newcastle in 1969 and became very active in sport. This led to him becoming secretary manager of the Walls End Soccer Club before leaving town. Now he's decided he's been away far too long for himself, his wife and his Several reasons, uh, family, friends and all that sort of thing have brought me home. My wife lives in Swansea or comes from Swansea and I come from East Maitland, so I'm happy to come back to the Hunter region for that, that very reason. And uh, secondly, the, uh, the challenge of the Hunter Development Board, I think, uh, will be very good for me. Just what do you know about your new job at this early stage? Well, very little at this stage, apart from what the Hunter Development Board is and what it's done in the past, uh, what its achievements have been, and I'm very keen to uh, follow them up. Of course, you're back, as you say, because uh, it suits your family, it suits your lifestyle, but what's made you come to this particular job? Well, it's very similar in a lot of ways to what I have been doing for the last eight years in Queensland, uh, in that it's a, a voluntary board uh, made up of community interests, and I'll be serving as a Chief Executive Officer. Uh, I've done that job very successfully in Queensland, and I'll be uh, happy to uh, follow it up here. When the final heat of the Corsair Class Championships got underway at Tukli today, winds were gusting at around 25 knots and four boats were still in there with a chance. The series has been one of the tightest in recent years. The last two years saw the series leader not having to sail in the final heat to win the series, but that was far from the case this time. Defending champion Dave Higgins in the doghouse took the series lead yesterday when the leader until that stage, Peter Hansen in Victorious, failed to finish after he dislocated his shoulder. Four times champion Hansen had been dogged by bad luck. He was a clear leader up until Sunday when he lived home back in the field with a broken tiller. Then yesterday there was the shoulder incident and it looked like it just wasn't his series. Regardless, he was out on the water again today, arm in sling. In fluctuating conditions, the one-armed sailor got the best of the field and scored his second heat win. Second today was Queensland's John Etherton in Hopeful with Dave Higgins, the doghouse third. The results were enough to give the doghouse the series, with Peter Hansen in victorious only 0.6 of a point behind in second place. The highest placed local was budgie boy sailor Jeff Beauchamp in sixth spot. Port Stephenshire Council resolved in early December to sell the commercial land to Salamander Projects Proprietary Limited, subject to there being no objections from the Minister for Local Government. Shire President Councillor Roy Taylor has since been notified by the department the Minister has no power to intervene in the sale. However, in what was described as a courtesy gesture, documentation forwarded by the Council has been examined. 
Salamander Project submitted a $1.61 million tender, its second attempt to buy the land. A development application for the site is still being processed by the Department of Planning and the Environment. However, project manager David Gray is confident the Salamander shopping complex will be open before the end of the year. Well, we, with our current program, we anticipate having a, uh, a grand opening in October this year. It's been said your second offer of $1.61 million was less than your first of $1.75. Is that the case? No, that's not correct because our original offer to Council of $1.75 million was based on a progressive stage settlement by offering $1.6 million cash up front, so to speak. The Council is getting the use of the money now and in real terms that represents more money to the ratepayers than our offer of $1.75 million. So you're saying Council got as good a deal? I think Council got a better deal at 1.61 than they would have got at 1.75 with stage settlements. A rationalisation of the police force has seen the OIC position in the water police here downgraded, leaving Sergeant Hardy overqualified for the job. Replacing him will be Sergeant Bill Nicholson, a former water policeman who's presently stationed at Halton. Sergeant Hardy is now destined for a general duties posting in the western suburbs of Sydney. A move he regrets but accepts. Well, I feel a little bit sad at going. Naturally enough, I live at Nelson Bay, I'd love to stay in the area, but there's no spot. So I'll go to Sydney and I'll do my job. You uh, have long to go in the service, or do you have a hankering to get back to Nelson Bay? Well, I'll be back at Nelson Bay. I, uh, I'm going to exercise my option of uh, 30 years service, which only gives me four years to go. And then I'll be retiring to Nelson Bay. Well, it's been a hectic eight and a half years at Newcastle. What's been the most memorable thing? I think probably the most memorable thing has been the uh, last year. We towed that catamaran 10-4 uh, into Foster, 29 and a half hours at sea. And after a very hectic experience out there, three of us we arrived home and exhausted. And after interviewing the master in charge, the we left the other lines and took off again. The life's not all beer and skittles, of course. You had your problems yourself. What went wrong the, the day that your boat caught fire? Well, that particular day, uh, Newcastle day Police Launch Mackay, uh, diesel engines explosion being the totally room. destroyed by it. We just couldn't keep the fire out, that's all. We had extinguishers going, we had everything going, but it was out of control. We could do little about it. So it just goes to show that you can always learn some more. We sure can. We learnt, and we hope everybody learns by these experiences. Well, of course, this is the boating season. What sort of advice can you give as, uh, as you depart? As you depart, Ray, tell the police where you're going, and like an aircraft, don't change your plans. This is the biggest headache we have. People change their plans, and we go looking for them, and they're not in the area. All the best uh, for your time, then, in the western suburbs of Sydney. Thank you very much. Nurses yesterday lifted two out of four bands at the Royal Newcastle Hospital following a meeting in Sydney. At that meeting, the nurses were notified Health Minister Ron Newlock had endorsed a report compiled at his request in December. His failure to respond to the report in previous weeks, coupled with dissatisfaction over staffing levels, had prompted the industrial action. Six terms of settlement were won by the nurses, including an agreement by the Minister that steps would be taken immediately to act upon recommendations contained in the report and approval given for the employment of eight full-time nurses. At a regional nurses association meeting last night, branch president Viv Allenson said nurses would consider lifting the remaining bans today. Bans she believes have been highly effective. I think they've been very effective. Uh, we have had uh, the eight positions filled. There are more to be filled yet, but that is a step. And also they've been effective in deploying staff to areas of need so that no acutely ill patient has suffered. Do you think other hospitals in the region may now follow suit in the wake of your success? Yes, tonight at the regional meeting some uh, people have said to us that they've been called upon to do work of other union members and they're most unhappy about that and I think the more they see that the, the budget cuts in the region are going to affect them in that way, they'll be quick to respond with industrial action.
thousands of litres of milk are being destroyed in the interest of public safety. In dairies banned from supplying milk by the New South Wales Dairy Corporation. In the Hunter Valley, six dairies are affected. The farmers, four in Dungog and two in Singleton, saw grain contaminated by the chemical from different places, making it a difficult task for the Department of Agriculture to determine its source. While the loss of milk has cost many dairy farmers dearly, despite the offer of interest-free loans from the New South Wales Dairy Corporation, authorities are patient to assure consumers there is no need for concern. The milk is sampled at farm level, and if there's anything wrong, it's rejected at that stage. It's, a, it's again checked at receiver factory level before it's pumped into bulk tankers to be taken to our Newcastle factory. General Manager of the Dairy Corporation, Bob Wan, agrees. He says even if some contaminated milk was to slip through the system, the chances of anyone being affected would be extremely slim. blaze in Ball Street Cooks Hill had all the makings of a disaster. The area is old and the fire could have easily spread through the roofs from house to house. There was also a gas leak where the blaze started in number 104 and officials say it was extremely lucky that it didn't explode. Fortunately the blaze was mainly contained to the vacant house but according to the district officer Royce Atkinson if it hadn't been for the excellent firefighting work it could have been a lot worse. Uh, we had a fire in uh, one property and because of the uh, uh, building construction of the uh, joining properties we had a flash from, from one to the other and had a bad situation for some moments there the fire went from building to building. Search and rescue units scanned the two adjoining houses but both were unoccupied. Owners were back this morning surveying the damage. Mr and Mrs Gill, who were holidaying at Taree, were woken at 6 o'clock this morning and told their house had burnt down. Although the damage was still a shock, they were relieved that their home had not been destroyed. The fire damaged one bedroom and spread into the roof. On the other side, the fire damaged the back veranda and bedroom of number 106. Its owner was at work at the time. Detective Peter Thomas from the police arson squad says the initial tests indicate that the fire was deliberately lit, but he says there are still more detailed tests to be done. Nurses were cautious of the peace plan proposed but voted to accept it in principle. Resolutions passed yesterday included a request for the nursing executive to clarify the number of nurses currently required in order to re-establish services previously offered at the hospital. The Director of Nursing, Miss Anderson, has been invited to report on the staffing situation at a meeting to be held on the 17th of January and that a vote of no confidence in the Chief Executive Officer, Dr Currow, and the Board of Directors of the hospital be passed immediately. The meeting condemned the board for their lack of interest and concern and their failure to initiate positive action to reverse the decline in patient services and the standard of patient safety as a result of inadequate staffing levels. Nurses also issued a further warning to the hospital. As I said earlier, if there is any undermining um, or if there's any reneging on, on the peace package, then the nurses um, have resolved that they will meet again to reconsider imposing the bans and possibly escalating any industrial action that they may take.
Reunited with family members, some scouts were still back at the campsite, reliving the most popular activity of the mall, Challenge Valley. I had to do all these um, activities and had to go through a lot of mud, water slides. Um, best part was there was this big wall, right? And you had to climb up it and then you had to jump off it into a big mud pit. Challenge Valley, you got mud all over you, black. You're just black. Was it good? And what did the big boys think? Uh, I just saw crawling through the mud and everything else, so uh, yeah, coming out with scratches and bruises, it was just unreal. Today, however, was one of sightseeing for the Fijian contingent, who met with some of the country's friendliest inhabitants. More introductions were made as the visitors saw first-hand animal life at the Oakvale farm near Raymond Terrace. According to those who participated, the scouting aim of fellowship was strengthened at the Jamboree and a special farewell song was performed in gratitude. The pavilion at the Maitland showground today was filled with the plaintive cries of Angora goats and the haggling of buyers and sellers. This private treaty Angora goat sale, the first held in the state, saw the majority of goats sold at good prices. Many of the buyers were businessmen looking to get into the mohair growing industry, which, at the moment at least, seems to know no bounds to its expansion. Only about half the world's demand for mohair is being met at the moment, and the Australian growers are finding the silky hair snapped up by overseas buyers as fast as the goats can grow it. And they grow two full coats of it a year, making the animals much more profitable than sheep. Angora goat milk and meat is also much in demand. In the hunter, the industry is only in its infancy, but the success of today's sale will probably lead to a full-scale Angora goat auction at Maitland next year. There's the possibility of it because of the, the great support we've had here today. Our animals and, uh, have, have been well supported by our region members to, to sell their animals, and uh, there's buyers come from all up and down the coast and inland as well, as far as Guyra, Canberra, Oberon, places like that. So, yeah, there's a lot of support for our in animals. This is John Church reporting. Good news today on the Newcastle Industrial Front. Australian industrial refractories have announced $5 million of extra contracts to produce these, bricks for the aluminium industry. They expect to employ an extra 35 people. Join Ray Deneen and Anna Manzoni for all the news tonight at 6. This English-built 280 locomotive has been on display at Freeman's Waterhole for the last 10 years, but the weather and vandals have taken their toll. The Richmond Vale Railway Museum has long had its eye on the train because of its historic value. So today, after months of negotiations, the train and coal hoppers lifted onto wide loaders for the trip to the museum site near Curry. It's hoped after two years' restoration to have the train running on the planned tourist line. This particular train was built in 1918 and saw active service in World War I. Firstly, firstly, it's one of only four left out of 700. Uh, secondly, it's uh, said to have been the locomotive that hauled the armistice train into the forest in France in which the uh, armistice was signed to finish the First World War. Uh, we consider the uh, locomotive as very historically significant for that reason alone. Today's lift and relocation was funded from a grant by the Joint Cobalt. Trucks from Hawkins and Hayter and the cranes from structural planes were provided at half price. Despite a smoke box door, which fell off on the way to Richmond Vale Colliery, the train is now in its new home with its future assured.